we begin in the name of God. Greetings. Welcome to another session of From the Desk of Ghamdi. Our discussion continues in the 23 question series and today we are starting the 147th episode. The topic under discussion is what is hadith. Today is the 13th episode of this series. Let us begin. Ghamdi Sahab, thank you very much for your time. Two standards for understanding hadith have been discussed so far. I request Ghamdi Sahab to continue the discussion from that point and tell us what the third principle is. The two principles, let us recapitulate them once more. One should have a literary taste for the Arabic language and hadith should be seen in the light of the Quran. The Quran has primacy. It is the text and whatever we find in hadith will be its explanation or its corollary. Therefore, as long as the base and the text are not kept in view, the explanation and corollary cannot be understood. The third principle is understanding the occasion of the hadith. Okay. This is the title I have given it. Understanding the occasion of the hadith. And I have written that the third thing is a hadith must be understood with reference to the instance and occasion of the topic it records. Whatever is stated in narrations isn't in the form of an essay neither is it some kind of organized piece of writing. The Prophet, peace be upon him, is talking and someone repeats some part of it from what he remembers. If someone observed some deed of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he recounts that deed. If some incident took place in the presence of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the details of it were reported. If the Prophet's, peace be upon him, approval or confirmation of any action was observed by someone, then that was transmitted by the narrator. However, what was the issue or what was the point in question? Was it a Friday sermon or was someone being advised? Whether a delegation had come to meet him? What was the occasion and what was its context? If you do not understand a sentence in its context and occasion, then at times its purport might change drastically. We are aware that if we remove the context and backdrop from a sentence, it would result in a lot of deficiencies in it. The verse of the Quran cannot be understood. Even verses of the Quran won't be clear. So what happens in this case, we need to know the context and backdrop that is available to us. Which surah and where in the Quran this verse has occurred? What is at the back of it and what comes next to it? The place where the surah has been positioned in the Quran. What is the objective of the Quran, which has to be taken into view? to reach the purview of its words. All those things become clear from the book itself. However, in the case of narration, we have seen the principle too. We saw the text too and put the Quran at the forefront as well. But when was this said and to whom was it said? Who was the addressee? If all these things are not taken into consideration, the purport of what is said will not become clear. Subsequently, its examples will follow too. The third thing is, a hadith must be understood with reference to the instance and occasion of the topic it records. That is, you can't just know from the sentence, when that sentence was said or where was it said, who is the addressee of the sentence, in what backdrop has the Prophet, peace be upon him, spoken the sentence, whether it is a sentence or sentences or some point. What was the occasion and context in which the point was said? Who were the addresses? A very important thing. What was the occasion? Was it said in Mecca or Medina? Or was it said on the occasion of war? Was it said to resolve some dispute? What was the time of it and what for was it said? What was its objective? What was the objective of it? What was the nature of the issue? A sentence was said or a sermon was given. There must have been a backdrop of it when such a thing was said. And who are the people whom it was spoken to? Who are the addressees? That is, were they companions or were they the close followers of the Prophet, peace be upon him? Were they the idolaters of Arabia or was it said during a conversation with the Jews? Who were the people spoken to? If one does not address all these questions in interpreting a hadith, on many occasions one fails to get to the right interpretation. This is our own experience as well. That is, you pick up something and then go and narrate it. So, I should have the opportunity to clarify that this was the context, this was said in such a backdrop and was stated in such a manner, this was told to so and so person. When these points would come to the fore, we would know what was it actually. Otherwise, 
If we catch hold of that sentence alone, then it is possible that a person may deduce disbelief from it. A person may deduce polytheism from it. It is possible that someone might infer some great misguidance from it, or he may create misunderstanding resulting in unwanted suspicion about some big personality. All this can happen. However, when the details are known of the occasion and about the person and the reason why it was said, then it becomes easier to get to its right interpretation. Ramdi Sahab, this is what generally happens among us in the case of court proceedings. That is, there are some big personalities, a comment is taken from them in place of the background, and then it looks like the entire issue gets reversed. This is what goes on in the courts and among the politicians, as well as in conversations. When propaganda is carried out, the same happens there too. Then refutations are to be given. It is told that my point has been quoted out of its context and its backdrop. Why is all this needed? The same is the situation in our day-to-day -day affairs. That is, we comment on someone among ourselves. At times, that comment is reported further onwards. If that point is spoken at some specific place or time, then it is quite appropriate. If that is quoted out of it, then it assumes a totally new interpretation. These are the experiences of our daily lives. That is, whatever point is stated, to understand it properly, its occasion and context would be seen. To keep this principle in consideration for understanding hadith is exceptionally important. Why is it exceptionally important? The reason is that the context and backdrop of hadith is not mentioned in words. That is, when we write a book, or when we write an essay, or when we give a sermon, and if it is heard from beginning to end, then the context and backdrop of the topic is fully clear. It is expressed in words. This is the ease of understanding the Qur'an. That is, we proceed with the word, reach the construction of the sentence, and then the context and backdrop become clear. Hence, the occasion on which the point was stated gets ascertained. Everything comes out clear whereas nothing of this kind happens in this case. When nothing of this kind happens, we have to rationally ascertain the occasion in which this is likely to have happened, or we have to refer to other narrations for its occasion, or ascertaining its occasion from the Qur'an becomes indispensable. You will have to adopt any of these methods. Till the time you do not do so, the right interpretation would not be possible. This principle is of extraordinary importance in the understanding of hadith. The hadith al aimatu min Quraysh is a famous narrative. I have given an example here. At this juncture, the complete explanation of these examples is not possible, just to make the point clear how big incidents have turned into never-ending puzzles. The Prophet, peace be upon him, stated that after him, the rulers of Muslims would be from among the Quraysh. Al-Aimatu min Quraysh were the words, that is, your Imam or rulers would be from among the Quraysh. The people heard this saying, There has been consensus among us for centuries that whenever Muslims would have to choose the rulers, they would see who among them were Quraysh's. Obviously, what impression does this give of Islam? It implies that one specific race or a nation or a tribe has been chosen forever for the position of leadership. This thing is against the general spirit of Islam. It is against its teachings. It is against the verse, Inna akramakum indallaha atkakum. In conclusion, it can be objected from a dozen perspectives. And what is the guarantee that someone only among the Quraysh would be fit for it? And he would be the only one who has the confidence of the people in him. All these aspects would appear before you. However, the narration exists and this point has been stated in it. The hadith al aimatu min Quraysh is a famous narration. It implies that Aima would be from among the Quraysh, that is, the leaders of Muslims, the words Imam and Aima used to imply leaders even during the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that is, for the rulers or for the Imam of Muslims. The hadith al aimatu min Quraysh is a popular narrative. By the apparent words of this hadith, scholars of our ummah have been led to believe that a Muslim ruler 
must always be from among the tribe of the Quraysh. That is, the directive has been given that till judgment day, that whenever and wherever the Muslims have to choose their rulers, they would look for a person from among the Quraysh to make him the ruler. This is the meaning that was taken. The Hadith al aimatu min Quraysh is a popular narrative. By the apparent words of this Hadith, scholars of our Ummah have been led to believe that a Muslim ruler must always be from among the tribe of the Quraysh. If this is accepted, then at least with reference to the political system, there appears to be no difference between Islam and Brahmanism. That is, we would be led to believe that, like the leadership is specially fixed for Brahmins in Hinduism, likewise, in Islam the leadership has been fixed for the tribe of Quraysh till judgment. That will have to be accepted. The Hadith al aimatu min Quraysh is a famous narrative. By the apparent words of this Hadith, scholars of our Ummah have been led to believe that a Muslim ruler must always be from among the tribe of the Quraysh. If this is accepted, then at least with reference to the political system, there remains no difference between Islam and Brahmanism. The basic reason for this mistake, that is, why did this mistake happen? The basic reason for misinterpreting this hadith is the fact that this statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him, related to the political situation which was to arise right after him, the directive stated in it was regarded to be an independent directive of religion applicable for all times. That is, the point was made for a specific occasion. It was stated in view of the situation prevailing at that time. For example, if we are talking about our country and say that these are the three parties, so and so party among them should rise to power, then it will be a comment about the present situation or it will be a comment about their political status. If this is made into a law applicable for all times, it would become rather ridiculous. Hence, something which was said in view of the political situation prevailing then that was taken out of its context. What is the topic of our present discussion? Understanding the occasion of Hadith. It was taken out of its context. That is, what was the occasion of it? It was the decision of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the political situation prevailing at that time. If you place it in the political situation prevailing at that time, it was an absolutely right decision. And it was an application of the right democratic principle. Therefore, we see that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, had himself stated it, he had stated the reason for it too, and said that, Anasu tabiyun li Quraysh. I am saying this because at this time the Arabs accept the leadership of Quraysh. At this time? At present. Anasu tabiyun li Quraysh muslimuhum li muslimihim wa kafiruhum li kafirihim. That is, their Muslims have the same status, and same had been their status at the time they had been in the state of disbelief. Therefore it was stated, Qaddimu Quraishan wala tuqaddimuha. He instructed the Ansar to step back and let the Quraysh take hold of the leadership. It was a decision based on the democratic principle, Amrahum Shura Bainuhum, which the Prophet, peace be upon him, had taken to resolve a crisis. It was an absolutely right decision. The basic reason in misinterpreting this hadith is the fact that this statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him, related to the political situation which was to arise right after him, was regarded to be an independent directive of religion applicable for all times. That is, the point was for a specific situation that was given the status of a permanent directive now, and it has turned into a law on an eternal basis. Thus, the consensus had started building on it. There are numerous such ahadith in canonical works. That is, this was just an example. And they cover very important topics. That is, it shouldn't be thought that what difference it will make if some point is quoted without its context and occasion. The topics those pertain to are significant too, keeping them in their proper context and time. The point becomes quite appropriate, but if you take them out of it, it becomes incomprehensible. There are numerous such ahadith in canonical works, and they cover very important topics. It is essential that they be understood in the right meaning, that is, the purport of those narrations, their subject, 
and their meanings to understand their intent, it is imperative to keep this principle in consideration. It has been mentioned in this that whatever the hadith, it should be known that it has a practical significance, it contains a practical expression of something, and something is said in it as per the situation. Till the time you do not ascertain its occasion and context, and do not adopt the right principle for ascertaining them. The point can be distorted to such an extent like in this case. A completely new idea had come forth that the point has been stated in Islam, and this is an eternal directive, and this should always be taken into consideration whenever Muslims would choose rulers for the Ummah in some region or in some place or for the whole Ummah, then they should be from among the Quraysh. When such things are generally stated, for whichever narrations, only when we would ascertain their context and occasion, when we would know where that point was stated, then there won't be the slightest confusion in interpreting them. And many people who reject various ahadith, their mistake would also become clear to them that the point made in that hadith in its time and place was absolutely right, and there cannot be any objection on it. How important is the occasion and context in the interpretation of hadith you stated the principle? However, I would like to seek a clarification. Please tell us that in the Quran or for any other writing, the occasion, context and backdrop is mentioned. The historical narration, if it isn't mentioned in some narration, just this much has been stated that the Prophet had stated such a point on such an occasion. To whom was it stated and when was it stated? What was the backdrop of it? Was it some sort of guidance or a good advice? When it is not present in the writing and the history too is in the form of written discourse, so how can we ascertain the occasion in the present times? Keep working with us, we would tell you, and the scholars have been doing this. Read the commentaries on hadith, even when the hadith experts comment on some hadith, they adopt several ways for it, and the tradition of Muslims adopts it as well. The ahadith relating to that particular topic are collected. That helps confirm the occasion and context. If some principle regarding it is stated in the Quran, as you relate them with it, the place and time or occasion come to the fore. If you look at the topic regarding which something has been said, what is the nature of that topic? Is it some political issue? or is it some social issue, or some societal or economic issue? Obviously, the person who has some knowledge about the deen is aware of the ideal teaching of Islam in such issues, and what are the issues of their applications. He is able to understand them quite well. At times, difficulties arise. Their rational possibilities should be looked at. In the way we understand some writing, and we get to know that there are a dozen meanings of a particular word, then what do we do? We put it in its context and backdrop. In this case, we place them under the possible time and context in which it could have been said. That is, such a thing the Prophet, peace be upon him, must have said based on this rational requirement or for this need or under this circumstance. We apply those possibilities to the sentence. Normally, the occasion is ascertained, and if some difficulty is faced, and nothing can be said with surety, then we suspend our judgment in such a case till the time another scholar can present his research for its context and situation. Okay, Gramdi Sahab, how important is this context and situation with regard to the interpretation of hadith? I wish to seek a practical example so that we can end the topic with it. You have worked on the narrations about the second coming of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, in the recent past, you have told the world that actually the occasion of it was a ruya dream of the Prophet, peace be upon him. What difference would it make if you declare it as an incident or a proof of testimony of the Prophet or a prophecy of the Prophet, peace be upon him? And when you consider the same thing as a dream of the Prophet, peace be upon him, then what difference does it make in the interpretation of hadith? It makes a lot of difference. It happens the same in case of the example you gave of the second coming of Jesus. If it is a ruya, dream, then it requires an interpretation. In that case, the incident can be in the capacity of an incident, and it may be allegorical in nature too, so both the possibilities have arisen. Now there would be ease in understanding. Just see that in the same vision where the second coming of Jesus has been stated, in that same vision, that incident has happened with the Prophet, peace be upon him, where the Prophet, 
peace be upon him, is presenting himself with regard to the prayer and Moses is sending him. The quantity of prayers is being reduced from 50 to 5. This point lacks sense in normal conditions. However, if it is vision, then it requires an interpretation. Obviously, we can say there how the significance of prayer has been symbolized. Hence, when it is confirmed that this is Ruya or an incident, or it is a visual experience or a commentary on some point, or a point stated in the state of a battle, or it was an instruction to reconcile between two warring parties. What is the occasion when such a thing was said? Or some advice for a human being. An advice with regard to status as a human being. All these things are related to their occasion and context. Then it becomes easier to understand them. No doubt there are difficulties, as it is not the Quran where we can ascertain the context and backdrop from the words. Here, in any case, mental effort is to be made, and at times it is met with failure as well. My experience is that after trusting God Almighty, if you go deep into this corpus, then our scholars have accumulated such a huge material and have done it with such painstaking efforts that hardly does anything remain unresolved. Okay, Gamdi Sahab, just one last aspect, for example, if we are not getting any clue, neither in the words nor in the commentaries or in the books of Hadith too, and neither is there any direct verse in the Quran. So on such an occasion, will you develop a possible context and occasion from your own imagination that this should be the case as the intellect demands it to be this way? And in such a situation, the Prophet, peace be upon him, must have said this thing as the other things are not helping. So can you use your mind to imagine a probable context and time? I said just now that rational possibilities would be considered. That is, compatibility of events will be ascertained through reason. Those issues that we face in the world, we imagine about them that perhaps some such issues would have been faced, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, might have said this in such a situation. We check that assumption with regard to its compatibility with the words, we see its compatibility with the entire spirit of the religion, and then we consider all other possibilities and so on and so forth. So the objective of presenting the notion of rational possibility is that since we do not have any other means except the intellect that God Almighty has given to us, in light of it, we can try and estimate about its time and occasion. Ramdi Sahab, what according to you are the principles for the interpretation of Hadith? Dear viewers, the third principle came under discussion today, understanding the occasion of the hadith. What follows next? The time is exhausted now. We shall be back in your service again. Thank you very much for your time till now. Thank you very much.